Are the mics? Oh, yeah, the mic. Good afternoon. Welcome to the session on accountability. My name is Ashraf Ghani. I'm chair of the transition in Afghanistan preparing the country for 2014 troop, international troop withdrawal and chairman of the Institute for State Effectiveness. Our focus is on accountability. The context is a global crisis of accountability. OECD countries are going to have the most wrenching experience in the next 15 years since the Great Depression. Because the crisis of public confidence in institutions has never been so critical and so acute. Simultaneously, the public has come to respect, to expect accountability for results. So it is not just that accountability is reduced to old accounting methods, uh, where if you do the right things, the public is going to respect you. They want a different kind of result, and that, of course, brings us to the youth. Uh, who, particularly in developing countries, or the majority, as the global population reaches 7 billion and the balance shifts radically to a younger generation, we are also in the middle of a generational transformation regarding expectations. And the name here is mutual accountability. Thirdly, we need a systemic change. It is not piecemeal accountability vis-a-vis -vis systems that have not delivered. The global financial crisis on the one hand and accompanied now by the global fiscal crisis or the other indicators of this. Uh, we have a fantastic panel uh, and what I'm going to do is to ask each of our panelists two questions in succession. Each Panelists will have five minutes to answer each of the questions. That will bring us to a total of 45 minutes. In the second half, we'll open up to you, the audience, uh, but for questions. So each question should be a maximum of two minutes to allow for maximum interaction so that they're not long uh, commentaries. Uh, my specific engagement with this comes from a book that I wrote uh, in 2009 called Fixing Failed States. It's about 100 governments I showed, among other things, cannot spend money because they don't have the systems. To be able to spend money properly takes systems of accountability. So it's not the question of money at first. It is the question of how to. Now I'm writing a book called The Accountability Imperative, which takes the 2008 fiscal crisis in the global response to that. And on that basis, I've classified systems into four types uh, that shows the degree of resilience or lack of. Uh, so with that introduction, let me begin, uh, with your permission, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Prime Minister, to start from the right and just uh, go on. Mr. Zobi, you have been a, a leader of the youth and simultaneously been in government. How do you convince the youth that establishing accountability systems takes time, and how, as a government minister, are you able to fill, fulfill a mandate or fail to fulfill a mandate vis-a-vis -vis your core constituency? See, um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Ahmed. I'm a global shaper. This is a new initiative that uh, has been launched this year for the WEF. Um, essentially, they, they picked youth that are capable or, or they, that they thought are capable of representing their, their cities, their hubs, in order to, um, I guess, uh, recognize the role that they play. Because the Young Global Leader Initiative, which is great, it doesn't take into account the 20 to 30 year, um, year olds who are, you know, as we've seen, been the drivers of change in this region through the Arab Spring. Now, um, I also work at the Jordan Investment Board. Um, it's a government uh, investment promotion agency, but I'd rather not talk about that for now. As a youth, talking from my experience in my country and the government that we've seen, the perception is extremely negative of accountability and transparency. There is no trust. It's gone. And it's, 
um, this is a reality. They have failed to address the needs of the youth. Um, it, things have been going on as if you know, um, you'll never be uh, brought to question over your actions. You'll never be held accountable. Even though on paper we have laws and we have rules and we have institutions that are supposed to take care of that. So, personally, as a 27-year-old, when I look at um, a statement by a minister or any government official, um, I take it with a grain of salt. Now, um, what can we do to address that? What can we do to change that? I think government officials need to get with the times, and they need to realize that, you know, people, that, that youth, they're, they're not stupid, they're not less intelligent than anybody else. We can get the right um, um, information about anything that happens. Um, just before this session, I was talking to a, a, a fellow um, gentleman from, from the UK, a, a reporter, and um, we were talking about how you know, you would read the newspapers, the official newspapers, just to figure out what the minister has to say today. And then I would go online and go to all those uh, sites or Facebook or Twitter or MySpace and then get the real news. And, you know, literally get the dirt on what happened in X place today. Why did this guy get fired or hired? And it's, it's, it's really necessary to respect our intelligence and no longer assume that just by saying something, and me not challenging it, that I believe it, or that I accept it. And I guess I'll, I'll stop there for now and give some chance. Thank you. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Fayed, you're a man of unquestionable integrity, but when you took over the Palestinian system, it was a disappointment to us all for its corruption, for its perception of corruption, for its perception of ineffectiveness. How have you managed to be a change agent and to lead one of the most difficult governance systems on earth under conditions uh, that would strain anybody's uh, resources in imagination? Thank you very much. Uh, I think the answer to a large extent lies in uh, some of what you said in your own introductory remarks. It's a focus on uh, the institutions, uh, getting them uh, uh, to be in strong enough shape to execute policy. Uh, and of course, uh, if they're being assumed uh, that the system is capable of promulgating policies that are capable of responding to the needs of those governed. It also lies in some of what you said uh, about the emphasis on uh, an approach that's result-oriented. But that too does require a framework for accountability in order to ensure that what you drive for in terms of results, what you seek to accomplish, is adequately known. This requires, first and foremost, in addition to what I told you about my own experience and emphasis on the need to strengthen institutions to begin with, uh, is um, uh, something that's related to overall governance. I mean, your, your approach to governance, what you think is important. And I think the basics here bear some emphasis. You need definitely a government that is responsive to people's needs. Uh, as the government sees them through the eyes of the public, those who are governed, those who are the beneficiaries of the services that the government is supposed to provide, and those who are most influenced by decisions governments take genuinely. Uh, and you need to really go out and, and say what it is that you're up to relative to that philosophy. Uh, not only in general terms, uh, not, it's not only the, the youth who became disillusioned with governments repeating time and again uh, and stating, restating statements of um, positions and policy in the broadest possible sense. Uh, just about everybody uh, became disillusioned I mean, throughout the region. Uh, pronouncements uh, time and again uh, of overall uh, laudable objectives, but with very little emphasis as to how those objectives might be attained. Uh, so I think you need to be specific. You need to have a plan. You need to have a vision to begin with. Uh, order priorities as you see them. Early on in your term, whatever your assignment is, whether you are uh, an investment officer, cabinet officer, prime minister, what have you, 
uh, you have to have a, a vision of what it is that you uh, in, intend to do, uh, uh, policies that you think should be followed, uh, and then specific plans capable of carrying out competently and adequately those policies. And hence the emphasis on uh, strengthening institutions as you go along. Now, uh, operating in Palestinian context, and I think for that matter, in virtually all cases that are called chaos or post-chaos countries, um, you know, you do not have the luxury of waiting until all stars are aligned perfectly when it comes to adequacy of institutions. You pretty much have to do the best you can with what you have, uh, improve the functioning of institutions and strengthen them as you go along. Uh, but you can't basically shut down and wait until all the institutions are in perfect shape. Uh, you, you don't have that luxury. Uh, throughout all of this, you need to be convincing. Uh, and you know, it's part of what you have to do. You may have the best message in the world, and you may have the best intentions, but you really have at all times genuinely to be willing to go out and face the public and explain things to them forthrightly. And where there are failures, to re be open about failures as well. To recapitulate, I think what is really essential is to focus on the strength of institutions. Mr. Zobi said something about governments and the inadequacy of institutions uh, uh, and, and the fact that there is this, this disillusionment. Uh, and he said it's not really for lack of laws or institutions. Uh, I would respectfully ask that that statement be reconsidered. It is true that there are sometimes institutions in name but they're not really solid enough, strong enough to function as strong institutions of state. There are processes of governance, even the most corrupt of regimes. Uh, there are processes of governance by definition, but are they adequate? Uh, and I believe uh, institutions generally uh, have not tended to get the attention that they deserve. Otherwise, we would not have had many of the problems in governance in this part of the world that we had. Uh, so the emphasis has to be on that, and since you mentioned also uh, uh, something about global financial crisis and all, uh, governance does not stop with coming up with adequate uh, regulatory regimes and frameworks uh, of a national variety. But also uh, enough attention uh, should be paid to developing adequate uh, governance uh, internationally uh, to really look after matters that cut across borders uh, as well. But generally, uh, uh, to close, I think the issue is really one of, of focus on the need to strengthen institutions because that's only when you can have meaningful accountability. Uh, and also, in addition to focusing on the formal side of things, the need for there to be uh, legislature, uh, functioning well and adequately and freely. Uh, I think in this day and age it's very important uh, to uh, pay enough attention to informal means of achieving accountability or exercising it or living by it. Uh, being open to the media, being open to the public, being open to civil society and not to look at civil society as, as competing with government. That, that's just a most ludicrous thing and I think you lose quite a bit uh, by going into uh, or thinking that you are in conflict with civil society. Uh, I guess I'll stop here. And I thank you. Would defer. Thank uh, you. There's a request that if we could stay slightly away from the mic because ah. it produces a noise. Oh, okay. uh, uh, Mr. Dajani. So nobody heard what I said. Right? <laughs> no, they heard yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but with a slight interference, which is usual. I can repeat. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Don't, I will not do it. <laughs> That's why you see he can get in the middle of the public. He has a sense of humor. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Dajani, the media, one side, you're the mechanism of informing people. But second, are you informed enough yourself about accountability and how to report on it? Because part of your reporting, uh, in general, is a tendency to sensationalize and reduce. How do we get to a media that is part of a solution uh, and part of a wider alliance for accountability? Uh, th thank you. Um, just briefly, I, uh, I work for Internews and we work in 62 countries around the world uh, working with uh, the empowerment of local media, which we feel it's the core of the creation of account accountability and transparency. Now, um, <clears throat> I mean, you, you said something very important. I mean, the, it, it, is, it goes back to the to the basis of the, uh, the core of reporting. I mean, what is, what is the core of reporting? It's really 
reporting on the story, telling the news and not getting into advocacy, not getting into uh, editorializing, sensibilizing uh, the events. Uh, and the most important thing, how do we get to this point, is really, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a two-way street. On one hand, you want the media to be the watchdog, the enforcer of accountability, the enforcer of transparency. At the same time, you want a professional media. And, and this is the most important thing. Uh, journalists who are well-versed in ethics, journalists who are trained in investigative journalism, journalists who can report on uh, issues around elections, and, and by building both the capacity of the media institutions and the skills of journalists, this is how you can ensure that you have uh, at least fairness and, and credibility. And the credibility issue is the most important issue when we get to that point. And why is that? Because if the public, and the public meaning the consumer, does not have faith in the media or in the reporter, how can you enforce that accountability thing when they don't have faith in you as a reporter or they don't have faith in you as an institution and you lack credibility because of several things? I mean, one, we could start by talking about freedom of expression. We could talk about f uh, free media. And so if you don't have free media in, in the country where you're going to be questioning uh, the accountability, then you have a, a real problem. I mean, we, I mean, I, I mean it, this is the core issue. If you don't have f free media, you don't have freedom of expression, then you lose everything, everything else. And then my colleague here mentioned earlier, you know, I mean, there is, I mean, now we're moving. We are in a, in a fast pace, pace uh, uh, and a battle for uh, the uh, putting that a citizen generated video without uh, questioning its authenticity without verification i mean you know when i when i started in media we we were taught uh, at least you follow the new york times rules of three independent sources or you could go even further to the wall street journal which was five independent so uh, sources now i question now when you have a story within minutes uh, you know, with the things that are happening now around the globe, what decisions are, um, are being made in those uh, newsrooms? And so we have a major issue now, you know, going back to the sources, but again, the most important thing is really getting the media back into its professional track and have trained uh, journalists to, to shine the uh, spotlight at, at the right uh, issues. Well, thank you. I want to welcome a special guest, uh, Secretary Albright, whose book, Madam Secretary, is a special model of policy making under transparent global conditions. Uh, it's uh, an opportune moment because I can give uh, Mr. Boucher a hard time. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to have you. System-wide accountability, your new job. Your old job, some people might say, uh, was to excuse a uh, breakdown of accountability at times. Uh, now, what is a system-wide approach uh, to accountability from OECD? I think uh, at, you know, at OECD what we're trying to do is help people build the, the mechanisms for transparency. Uh, and so you can have you know, new public procurement systems, you can have disclosure of officials' assets, you can have uh, you know, all kinds of things in government that show people what's going on. You, you have comment periods when you make regulations, et cetera, et cetera. And so you, you open up the government, make it more transparent, so people know what's going on. People then need the tools to do something with this. And um, that part of that civil society, part of it's the media, uh, and, and having people out there who can then take, you know, whatever the raw data is and analyze it, you know, that's part of it too. And somehow all the pieces have to come together to make it meaningful. You know, you see this demand for accountability exploding all over the world. It's, it's the Occupy Wall Street. To some extent, it's the riots in London. Uh, it's certainly the Arab Spring. Um, and you see it all over the world, the demand to know what government's doing and to hold them accountable on a daily basis. Two things are different. One, we used to say, 
accountability takes place through elections every two years every four years you know do the right thing the voters will then decide whether to renew you it happens on an hourly and daily and minute by minute basis now and government's not set up to deal with that uh, certainly the State Department spokesman is not set up to answer <laughs> questions all day long every day uh, although sometimes the Secretary of State is the uh, the, the second thing that's going on is, is the convergence of all these forces. In India, you have a massive anti-corruption wave going on right now and a real effort to deal with it. And it's hard to decide what's new in this picture. The media has been taking pictures of politicians with briefcases of money for a long time. Uh, there have been people in government working on improving government systems for a long time. They did pass about a year or two ago a uh, Right to Information Act that let people really get in and get government information a lot more freely. That's part of the effort. But somehow between the information and the governance and the judicial system and the civil society, it kind of clicked. And there's this just mass movement to make government more accountable, to pass new laws and to provide more information and use it well. And so. I'll look forward to reading your book where you tell us how these factors come together sometimes, but not others. Thank you. Uh, one interlocutor, despite our attempts, that is missing on this panel is the private sector. Uh, so let me ask you, Mr. Zubi, you've shown your disenchantment with government, despite being a leader in the government. How do you see the role of the private sector in its contribution? Are we building the right market institutions in this part of the world, or is the market institution itself an area where there are significant issues of accountability also? See, um, to an extent, um, the private sector may be benefiting from the lack of accountability. And, and when I talk private sector, you know, I mean the typical, you know, big company, big contracts, that type of stuff. I'm not talking about, you know, small enterprises and all that. They, they actually do benefit. There is a, a resistance to transparency and openness. And that's known because, um, you know, there's vested interests everywhere. And status quo, nobody wants to change. If it's, if it's working well for them and they're making money off of it, why change it? So. Um, it's, it's people in position of power, um, and they can do whatever they want. Now, how do you get them to the point where they click? See, that's really, really interesting, because you talked about regulations, you talked about institutions, and you talked about the people and the media. So um, institutions, let's assume they're there. Regulations, let's assume they're there. People, I'm sure um, everyone would benefit from more openness. And then you have the media who, let's say, is also fighting for it. What is the secret ingredient that makes them all come together and, and uh, begins a serious push to purge out all of these, um, you know, let's say, corrupt elements, to, to, to openness? To be honest, I, I, I have no idea. Now, but I can bring a, a close example. Let's look at um, the Arab Spring and the... Um, you know, like, okay, what triggered the Arab Spring? That's a question me and my friends, you know, talk about a lot. Was it political in nature? Was it the need for freedom? Or was it jobs or lack of, of, of income? So I'm not sure. It could have been all of them. But the trigger that made it click was this one very angry guy who just went up and set himself on fire. So... Do we need to reach that stage before we can actually make a change? I really hope not. I think we're all sensible. And I think that um, um, a serious push is happening in all of our region. And the private sector can, they, they need to realize that they can benefit and that things will be better if people can um, um, compete more, if there's more openness, if there's, if there's you know, like, um, less, if, if the government stops interfering in the private market, that could also be um, um, open up a room for the private sector to play. And I don't know, I'm just really waiting for you to just tell me what made it click in India. That would be great for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister Fayed, you mentioned institutions as the critical element. 
Yeah. You've had a distinguished career internationally. Now as Prime Minister, the advice that you've received on institutions, how much of it is workable and how much of it is a cookie cutter uh, that is provided across the board and not tailored to context. Where does leadership come in and where does partnership come in this institutional change agenda? At both ends of it, uh, for sure. Uh, good governance uh, as a basic proposition has certain tenets that are international in nature. Uh, good governance in uh, Palestine fundamentally is not at its core different from good governance in the United States, and they are another country for that matter. Basics are the same. Responsible and responsive government. One that is accountable, one that is for the people. Uh, and in the sense, therefore, one that works very hard on leveling the playing field, ensuring that uh, everybody has a shot at making it, essentially, uh, as opposed to uh, intervening in the economy in a capricious way, uh, highly unpredictable. Businesses need a good uh, environment of law and order, uh, predictable contract enforcement. Uh, May I ready. ask you to move the, ah, the yeah. speaker slightly? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the mic. Uh, so essentially, these are the basic elements. And here, of course, uh, I, I think, uh, of course, there are differences uh, in terms of how these messages are communicated and conveyed. Um, uh, cultural differences do exist. Uh, and uh, here, of course, you need to adapt the message, essentially, to ensure it, that you connect uh, with, with those you are targeting for connecting with. Uh, you can't take uh, a message uh, delivered one way in India and expect that all the time is going to really work the same way uh, if you were to do it in Palestine or somewhere else for that matter. So I do not believe it's a question of different principles or precepts. Uh, in the main, it's really a question of how do you adapt those basic principles to ensure that they fit the context in which you're operating. I mentioned some of the elements that matter to the business community. In an environment where you have poor governance frameworks, and I'm not really only talking about government, uh, weak governments, but also weak civil society institutions, weak private sector institutions, a weak regulatory regime that does not really ensure that private sector participants has, have an equal shot at things, where there is not really a high degree of concentration. An environment like this produces what economists call rent-seeking activity. Uh, I guess this is what Mr. Zogby was referring to. Some might benefit. Yes, indeed, from any status quo, with all of its inadequacies and intricacies, you're going to have rent-seeking activity that is going to work to the benefit of one player or another. It is doubtful uh, that this is going to work out uh, for the best of the country as a whole uh, over time. I think it's really in the, best, uh, uh, in the best interest of everybody, the government and those governed, for there to be complete acceptance of the notion that governments should act in a responsible and responsive fashion, that governments should be accountable, that government should be a government for the people, not over them, uh, if you will, genuinely, genuinely. You have to be passionate about what you do, but it's almost as if you really don't want to do it. Uh, it that's the irony of it, you know what I'm saying? Striking a balance between these two and being open to being replaced or removed is, is something that's very important too. Do not assume and do not come across as someone who really knows it all. Uh, there's someone out there who has a better idea. Either you listen to them or you make way. Thank you. Mr. Dejani, governments do not now control the monopoly of information. Yet their habits in the Middle East at times have been as though they're still the sole uh, controllers of information. In this regard, two questions. One, how do you, as a media professional who spent your life on this, interpret the Arab Spring in terms of its key demands? And two, are, are governments learning to communicate better in terms of what they are achieving and building the bridges with the public through the media? Well, um, <clears throat> I don't totally uh, agree that uh, governments don't control the uh, information, especially when it comes to this region. I mean, we've made major headways 
and uh, from having just strictly uh, government-controlled TV, TV stations focusing on protocol news, etc., with the advent of Al Jazeera and so on. However, we have, I mean, it's not a monolith. Let's, 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 let's just make that clear. Every country is, is different. But the control on, on the information comes uh, from different forms. It doesn't have to come just from the political aspect. We have also the economic and the commercial. I mean, let's, if we look at ad revenues throughout this region, 70% plus of the ad revenues come from the Gulf states. So when you have, as I, I'm talking about the small operators, you know, the indie media, independent media, uh, you know, owners who are trying to get a piece of the pie, they have a very hard time at, at receiving it. And, and, and hence you have a lot of influence coming from, from abroad, even when it comes to, to, local, to local media. Now there is also another issue which I, I, I talked about it earlier. There is the issue of credibility, that most people have lost credibility in their own uh, media or television networks. Um, people who, who, whether they sit right here in Jordan or in Morocco, etc., why do they watch, for example, regional media outlets or international media outlets? This is the question. Why they, you know, instead of uh, referring to their own news, why do they have to watch uh, the news coming from a small uh, country like Qatar through Al Jazeera rather than receiving it from their own uh, media outlet? There is an issue of credibility that maybe has been changing, but it has been changing slowly. And the other part of the question, which is, why do they, st why do they now uh, refer to citizen-generated videos? why YouTube is more important to them than reading uh, their local newspaper. I mean, I mean, these are issues that happen throughout years that uh, created a schism between the consumer, the public, their own media station, and, and their government. So un until we move to, towards a 100% of freedom of expression, until governments in the Arab world and, and other countries come to terms uh, when it comes to media laws, uh, protecting the rights of journalists, making sure that there are rules and regulations that, that govern uh, these institutions, not just to, to censor them, but rather to, to protect the right of, of uh, producing you know, uh, independent and, and free media, we have a problem. And, and this is where we're at now. Uh, we're, we're at this kind of point in history where we have made a lot of stride towards uh, moving, you know, towards uh, uh, move, uh, moving towards freedom of expression. Yet there is a lot of suspicion. Thank you, Mr. Boucher. When you watch the Greeks come to to the streets, or you see Wall Street occupied. How do you position OECD, which is focused very much on national level systems, promotion of national level systems of accountability, at governing globalization? As Mr. Fayad mentioned earlier, can we really move forward without having certain agreement on global standards of governance in mutual accountability across the board? I guess you can. I mean, we, we try to be a very economic organization. We try to stay away from the political side. We try to give our advice, whatever the, the effect is going to be. And it's based on best practices. It's based on using the experience of everybody we talk to, members, non-members, different countries, and saying, well, these are the best practices, basically giving people their policy options. Uh, now, that said, you come down to certain hard facts. and. Hard facts are hard to deal with, you know, that you can't have, you can't just keep giving everybody a job in the government. You can't keep giving everybody a long-term retirement plan if they're going to live 10 years longer than anybody else used to live. Uh, you can't let people retire earlier and earlier, live longer, and pay their health care all the way through. So governments are having to grapple with this. Now, the, the issue of accountability also gets to sort of People are, you're accountable to different groups for their particular interests. So the Greek public employees are going to get hurt in these changes. And they're out in the streets complaining about that. 
um, but for the society as a whole, it's better. So somehow for the politicians, you've got to maneuver your way this, through this. Um, but we just tell them what the good economics is and let them figure out how to do the, uh, the politics of it. And in some ways, as you look around the world now, as you look at the U.S. failure to deal with its budget problems, at the European failure to deal with the Eurozone and the Greek crisis, uh, and even some of the things going on elsewhere, it's more a failure of politics than economics and the inability of political systems to make those hard decisions. And that goes to the very core of democracy sometimes. You have to ask yourself if, if the middle class are the ones who vote, aren't political systems going to reflect the middle class interests more than anybody else in society? And that, um, that's a question that I can't answer for you either. Well, thank you very much. Now, uh, may I turn to the audience? Uh, if you could raise your hands, please. Uh, yes, to begin with here. Uh, if you could specify questions, please, and direct them uh, to somebody in the panel or uh, address the panel as such. Uh, Mike's, please. Thank you. Yes, Peter Breen. I'm a headhunter with Hydrogen Struggles, one of the top three American-based uh, headhunters in the world, 75 offices around the world. Uh, I've been working in the region for the last 20 years. Um, listening to the conversation, and particularly uh, young Mr. Zuby, uh, it strikes me, again, as an observation that most of the spring revolution was triggered by younger people. Um, and it strikes me also that mostly us old guys don't get it. Uh, I've got a six-year-old grandson in Dubai who checks the news every morning on his iPad. Six years old. So uh, given that most governments are formed of, with all respect, old guys, uh, when we're faced in a difficult corporate governance situation, either with a government-owned or indeed privately-owned company who can't or won't change with the speed that we'd like them to, we very often recommend they should adopt an advisory board so that they can augment their governance with some outside input. As a question to the panel, uh, and particularly to uh, Mr. Zuby, do you think it would be a good idea that all governments made it a point of policy in the region but elsewhere in the world, to Mr. Boucher, that they form an advisory board of people no, no older than the 27 years that Mr. Zuby has so that they can actually get in touch with the youth of the world who are actually changing the world in a way that even Mr. Zuby doesn't quite understand? Would you begin, Mr. Zubi? Of course. Um, thank well, you, Mr. Mr. Peter, thank you very much for this, this question. Um, this advisory board, how are they going to get appointed? In a transparent manner? Probably not. In, in this region, let's be frank, it's probably going to be like sons of ministers and all that stuff. Like, uh, uh, like, uh, in theory, it's great, and I'm with it, but it will work if this, the, 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 the system's already there. If they're already, um, let's say, listening to the traditional stakeholders, which they're not, then maybe they can add one more group. But I am totally for it. It's better to have one than not to have one. Um, the structuring could be, it's, it's not very clear to me where would they report to and how would they operate. But it's always good to have feedback from all different um, levels of society. And you know what? I am all for this idea. Mr. Boucher, would you like to come? I was going to say, we, we work a lot on corporate governance in, in this region and around the world. And I was just at a, we did an Asian network on corporate governance meeting in Indonesia a couple weeks ago. And they, they put a similar question on the table, which is, okay, you guys always say corporations need independent directors, so that there need to be people on the board who are not independent. And in a region, really not unique to that region, it's all over the world, where companies are either dominated by a, a big family or dominated by the government, they appoint, you know, independent directors are your cousin instead of your brother or you know, the retired uh, uh, congressman instead of the retired general. You know, this is kind of six of one, half of, the dozen, half of the dozen of the other situations when you start appointing independent directors. And they said, how do you ensure true independence of directors? 
and and we went through a lot of examples from the region and you know Australians uh, hire private investigators to make sure they don't have ties. Uh, there's a lot of ways of doing it, but getting truly independent people, whether they're young or old, hard to say. I mean, yeah, sometimes just looking at a table of directors and seeing different kinds of faces, different ages, uh, men and women, uh, different ethnic backgrounds, you know, that ought to give you some clue. Uh, I, I had an uncle that ran a manufacturing company in the 50s and the 60s, and he was very proud of a, a, a setup he did once with mirrors uh, of the board of directors meeting, and he was sitting at every single chair. Uh, in the uh, in the room, and it was a great photo. But I think that's really the way American corporations were run too. Um, you can't ensure total independence, but you do need diversity, and diversity ought to be evident. Uh, yeah, just just briefly. This is actually a very good uh, observation because I remember when I was in Tunisia, in, in fact, during the revolution, and then a couple of months after when the uh, uh, the uh, Prime Minister then, uh, Ganoushi, also resigned. Uh, someone uh, did an ob uh, statistics or observation about the remaining ministers and came up with the average age at 67 and a half. And in fact, the uh, Minister of Youth at that time, uh, the Minister of Youth, so I'm going to re uh, repeat that, was pushing 70. And, 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 and so that's a problem. But I don't want to kind of like wave the American flag, especially since now Secretary Albright is in the audience. But I work out of D.C. and I'm, I'm usually very impressed visiting uh, Congress and, and congressmen, offices, etc. for the amount of young people. Yes, we have what they call the, the gray hairs, whatever, in Congress, etc. But they are surrounded by so many young people in their 20s, interns, new graduates out of college or in graduate schools. And I think that's the key to keep you, to keep you connected with the youth. You know, you might be an elder man or whatever, but if you kind of surround yourself with that energy, decision making will be different. Uh, Mr. Fayette, is it to have an advisory group or is it to be accountable as an issue to the, to the youth? Are we mixing substance in form or does the form matter? Uh, if I said there's nothing wrong with gray hair, I uh, had it since I was freshman college. <laughs> <laughs> Problem is, I believe uh, we don't have in this region enough elections or elections that are held with regularity or elections that are open, transparent and inclusive. If we did, populations in this region tend to be young. In Palestine, more than 50 percent population are 18 years of age or younger. The elderly, defined as 60 plus, constitute only 4.4 percent. If you think about it, if this region had, and if it were to have, elections with regularity, elections that are open, transparent, fair, and inclusive, generally, elections laws provide for uh, people as young as 18 years of age to vote, some 17 even. They'll be represented. I prefer that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with advisory boards, councils, and all of that. I prefer to begin with formal structures, again, institutions and good, solid governance processes. Now, good government requires that you open yourself up to civil society, youth, uh, what have you, uh, vested interest, various groups, interest groups. You, you really need to be open uh, and, and, and uh, in touch, so to speak. But none of this is a substitute for formal accountability, accountability that can be exercised only through the ballot box and only connect between politics and economics. I've heard it said enough times, as a matter of fact, this I used to work for such institution before. We do not get into political matters, sure. Yeah, uh, it's only uh, economic matters and the rest of it, but everything is related to everything, as you but know. both of us have worked in those institutions, yes, so yes, we indeed. know the fiction. Yeah, it, it, and it really is indeed fiction. Uh, and to pretend that the connection is not there is really uh, definitely uh, not helpful. How do we really bridge the gap? Yeah. In government, everything is political. Make no mistake about it. Nothing is technocratic. I mean, yes, you need technocracy, definitely. You need 
policies formulated in line with priorities you want to achieve and instruments and tools uh, of intervention to translate those policies into reality consistent with objectives. This is generally true, for sure. But to sell any of this to the public is a political activity. Make no mistake about it. Doesn't matter. Whether it's deficit reduction, anything. So maybe the best thing to do, since I'm a believer in elections, and, uh, uh, and you know, sometimes it is said these days, you know, democracy is not really only about elections, and I agree with that, but this should not really belittle the importance of elections. I think the best thing to do is uh, to try to really actually put these political uh, methods on the one hand with the technocratic, uh, technical economic methods on the other hand in one part is to have um, a four-year budget cycle and to have people vote for their elected officials and their budgets once every four years or something like that. Because then you would not have at least some of the problems you have. One of the problems that we face, I, I didn't think this through, so if, if this sounds as too odd, forgive me. I just uh, was thinking about it as, as Richard was make, making his comments. Uh, you know, this business of having a battle every year to try to reduce the deficit and then spend most of the year trying to really say something about it, just not very helpful. You vote for a government and entrust it to the task of running the finances of the country on the basis of a given platform in terms of deficit spending or the opposite for four-year term, and it's doable. There are countries who are, uh, that, that act on the basis of multi-year budgets, two-year cycle, uh, medium-term framework, like three years, but not a formal four-year budget cycle. Something like this, maybe. Well, in the case of Congress in the United States, the House is two years anyway. But uh, something like that, moving things in, in, in that direction, could provide a, a bridge between the political, which is always there. Don't you know, make no mistake about it. Yeah, and the economic and technocratic on the other hand. The only country that I know of that actually costs the, pro the political programs of parties yeah. and makes it available to the public in a very transparent manner is Australia. B by law, the Auditor General costs both the government party and the opposition party. And that's the sort of movement where political and, and technical processes really come to. The audience, please. Uh, more comments. Yes, sir. You sir. A uh, question for Mr. Dejani, please. Um, one of the most... Uh, if you could introduce yourself, sir. Yeah, my name is uh, Jamal Al-Kishi from Saudi Arabia, Chief Country Officer for Deutsche Bank. Um, one of the most potent uh, means for enforcing accountability in, in any society is having fair, objective, and free media outlets to follow up, comment, and investigate matters related to responsible officers in government, the private sector, and other places. We don't have that in, in, in the Arab world, and we will never have that if we are honest with each other uh, until we have freedom of speech, which is a prospect uh, we can't, we can't uh, foresee in the immediate future. Um, I do have hope as an Arab citizen, of obviously given the Arab Spring and the changes in certain governments, that that will be effectively the, uh, um, the beginning of some positive progress in that direction, at least in the countries affected by the Arab uh, Spring. Do you share that optimism, or is it, is it something that we should uh, um, uh, we should uh, forget about for the foreseeable future. Obviously, when I say objective fair media, people can say Western media, for example, qualify for that. But we all know that indigenous media is the one most capable of actually addressing, uncovering, investigating the issues in a proper way. Sometimes we, we listen to BBC, CNN, um, and, and what have you, and they frankly, they lack the feel for the place, they, they, la they lack the, the insights into it, the means of getting into, into truth. So we need our own. But as a media person, what is, what is your perspective on this? Mr. Dajani, please. Thanks. I, I think this is a very good point. And I can reflect on two things. One, raising the standards and training more uh, journalists in niche reporting. And why I say this, this is not getting all the way into the 100% free media 
that we uh, desire to, re to reach or achieve, whether in the Arab world or everywhere else. And I'm very optimistic. I think we will get to that point. And the reason I say that, again, going from a, on, uh, uh, drawing on personal experience, uh, when I uh, visited Iraq, uh, which uh, about a year ago, I was uh, stunned by, for example, the existence of uh, uh, pirate uh, oil sellers. In, in fact, I, I kind of compare them to the hot dog stands. Uh, people who had just big containers or plastic uh, barrels of oil selling them to taxi drivers, and I've asked the question, who owns this, who operates this? No one was able to give me the answer. And then digging deeper, then you find out that Iraq itself, which is its economy is dependent on oil, you cannot count a handful of reporters in that country who can report on the extractive industry. They just have no training of whatsoever. I mean, beyond telling you the price of oil went up by one dollar or went down a dollar. So, so getting into to the, to the training aspect of, of uh, creating a cadre of niche uh, uh, journalists is, is very helpful. The other part, I look at the, uh, the experience that we, I, I belong to a, uh, I'm on the board of New, uh, New America Media, which is uh, a, um, an organization in the U.S. that brings ethnic media outlets together to, in order to empower them and create some sort of an affiliate system. In this economy today, believe it or not, when it comes to print, uh, most media outlets run in the red. They're, they're, they're not profitable. I mean, now they've given ways to the internet, to TV, etc., except for ethnic media in the U.S. And why? Ask the question, because this is coming back to local media. And the reason is they have an audience because, you know, uh, the United States is a diverse society. You have the Latinos, the Chinese, uh, Arab Americans, etc. They, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, Mexican American who lives in, in, in San Francisco is more interested uh, to, uh, to, uh, to learn about uh, the events that happen in, in his neighborhood, in, in his barrio, rather than what happens thousands of miles away in China. Etc. So bringing it back on focusing on local media would be a real empowerment and, and that will push towards that accountability and the transparency issue because no one is more interested about one's government than the locals, right? I don't need to have someone to investigate what happens in Tunisia who is going to come uh, from Egypt. I need a Tunisian to work on this. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes, in the back, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mohamed Al Karaki. I'm partner at Ernest and Young Jordan. Uh, my question is to Mr. Zabi, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really very worried about you know having a 27-year-old. A uh, young man who's uh, who's really that worried about about everything. Actually, uh, to be quite frank, I want to ask you know one question, and please, I need an answer because uh, maybe you raise more questions than than answering any of of uh, of uh, the concerns that has been raised by by the public. <coughs> uh, what really youth need now, actually, after the Arab Spring, after considering all the happenings now, what really youth want? You know, I'm, I'm looking at you as example. You know, you're a panelist sitting next to those gentlemen, and definitely you have been recognized. So, what we can do for the youth to be recognized? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Subi. Thank you very much, Mr. Mohammed. So, essentially. What you're asking is, what do the youth need in order to move forward from the stage now, now that the Arab Spring is here and now that our voice is being heard? Now, it's, it might have been said already, but you know, we, the youth have said what they want. Now it's time to implement it. Now it's time to take that and act upon it. So I don't expect governments to change. I don't expect, you know, leaders to change. 
But wh whoever is already there, what I expect from them is to listen and to actually do. And you know what? As youth, again, I'm 27. I'm, um, I'm you know, still not a minister. I'm hopefully, inshallah, planning on it. But, but the, the, the point is, when I get there, I can do it. Right now, I'm out of the system, I'm out of the loop. And please, do not consider me as a government employee. I'm talking on behalf of the thousands upon thousands of, of, of middle class and lower class citizens across the region. They literally can't do anything other than complain. And it's only now that people have begun to listen to them because their complaints have actually made changes. Now, don't expect them, okay, to, 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 okay, so they did the first half of the formula. Don't expect them to even carry it. They're not going to overthrow a regime and bring their own regime and start, you know, making rules and regulations. There's still responsibility for our, our, um, our seniors, our adults, those who are more experienced. And my direct answer to you is, what, they, you know, what do the youth need? They need people not only to listen, but to act upon what has already been said. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, please, over there. Hi, my, na my name's Chris Eaton-Harris. I'm a member of parliament from the United Kingdom. And I was just wondering, um, for all the panelists, really, uh, do you not think that the Arab Spring has brought about a huge amount of expectation as to what could be delivered by new fledgling governments? People want jobs, people want houses, and the experience of South Africa and other countries that have gone through similar things is that these things take a great deal of time. So how do you balance expectation against time? Uh, Mr. Fayed, may, may we begin with you? Uh, I, I think it's a good question, and there's no question uh, that some of that is uh, part of the outlook, uh, and something for governments to consider. Uh, you know, after a period of upheaval, like uh, the one the region, I wouldn't say has gone through, maybe is still going through, there's no question, uh, given the backdrop against which it happened, that there's going to be this enormous expectation uh, of governments that are going to be next uh, to see first uh, whether or not they're going to be perform better than uh, previous governments. And governments, as a matter of fact, generally speaking, have not failed relative to the expectations of the youth only. Let's remember, I mean, it's not a question of the youth being uh, happy or not happy. Governments failed miserably, generally, relative to every age group and every and gender, whatever category we may want to look at. Governments have not performed adequately, period. Vis-a-vis -vis citizens. Vis-a-vis -vis citizens. Vis -vis citizens. Now, the youth took on this issue first. It's not the first time in history this happens. You go back to the 60s. France and other countries' examples where students led important movements that led, that led to change. But going back to the question, yes, indeed, I believe there's going to be this problem. There is this problem already. And there's going to be impatience, maybe even growing impatience with the uh, new governments uh, in terms of them being unable to deliver relative to expectations. But there again, I believe uh, the emphasis would be right on, on getting governments to function properly and responsibly and openly, openly. Uh, there's nothing that beats being open with the public. Frank, tell it as it is. Uh, you know, here's what you intend to do. Uh, these are the difficulties. Um, there's important loss in output that has taken place already as a consequence of these events. Uh, making up this production gap, if you will, uh, is going to take some time. Uh, no matter which way you go around it or try to go about it, it's going to take time. Nothing beats being in constant communication with people on this matter openly, directly, and not only through the legislature, however that important, uh, however important that is, and it is very important. But take your message as government to the people directly, in their own communities, through their local representatives, through media. You cannot speak uh, enough times about uh, issues of expectations, so try to really manage those expectations in a realistic way. Uh, and where you don't do as well uh, as you had hoped you would do relative to expectations, be open about it. Acknowledge failure. That's one way in which you really can begin to distinguish yourself 
uh, as government of new era relative to government old style, so to speak, judged so by the public generally, whether we're talking about men, women, elderly, young, uh, youth, what have you. Uh, Mr. Boucher, uh, yes, please. No, I, w I was just going to say, I, I'm not as pessimistic about the immediate, you know, the, the short term in this region, that this was a region that, that by and large was growing about 5% a year, pretty healthy, not just the hydrocarbon producers, but others, um, that has en enormous assets, pretty easy to exploit, uh, uh, sunshine, alternate energy, fruits and vegetable production, tourism, things like that, uh, that can come online fairly, fairly quickly. Um, and I think you'd get a benefit out of uh, just the end of turmoil. You know, that a lot of this will come back. That foreign investment will start to come in. It's an exciting region. People are looking at it now. And, you know, frankly, to that extent, Muammar Gaddafi's death helps everybody uh, because it sort of tells people, okay, the period of turmoil is over. Now we're going to get on to building new things, doing things differently. The elections go well in Tunisia. The elections go well in Morocco and Egypt. And at the end of November, uh, people start to get a sense that the the region's doing something new. Governments then have to show that they're doing something new too, and they have to show they're governing in new ways, just the way the prime minister said. Mr. Dijon, um, I'm not that uh, optimistic as far as things going to come back very quickly, because also we haven't answered the question about youth. What what? youth want, I mean, maybe we are getting into the social reform point, but no one is talking about jobs. You, we have the highest unemployment ratio, I mean, in, in these countries out of anywhere in, in, in the whole world. So when the dust set, settles, I mean, you could give every, uh, everybody all the freedoms they want, they can speak whatever on, they want, on, you know, that's on their mind, but at the end of the day, you have a high number of unemployment for people who are under the age of 27 or under the age of 24. And we have a major imbalance now in the region economically uh, between the haves and the have-nots. So if the, the haves don't start providing jobs some, some way, we're, we're just going to go back to square one and we're going to see the Greece uh, model. Or uh, it does, This time it won't be about a tyrant, we are the removal of a tyrant. It would be about the removal of entire governments because they're failing to put bread on your table. Mr. Sufi, would you like to comment? Or? Sure, sure. I'd like to talk a bit more about the, let's say, job creation um, issue, which is very, very important. Now, the problem that we're, we're facing, and I'm talking this, again, out of my experience, it's that, um, you know, uh, let's, let's look at a country like Jordan, where uh, resources are limited, capital is limited. So uh, in order to support growth, you always look to, you know, foreign investment or even local investors. But generally, let's look at foreign investments. What, why would I, as a country, try and attract foreign investment? I do that because I realize that foreign investors, they come, they bring with them best technologies, best practices, new business processes. And they're willing to, let's say, utilize what, the, the resources that I have, which in Jordan's case happens to be human capital. We have a lot of talented uh, individuals, very highly educated relative to the region. All they need is an opportunity to apply themselves. And when, you know, as a government, if I look at the situation, I realize that domestically I am incapable of providing jobs or funding for jobs. Then I work on, I work on other things. I focus on training programs. I focus on educational reform. I focus on matching the output of universities to the demands of the market. I, I, vocational training is, is a great thing. Okay, um, also try and, and, and focus on sectors that are actually um, employ more people per dollar invested, like services, like tourism, as opposed to focusing on heavy industries. So th there's a lot that can be done, and a lot of it, you know, just falls under uh, regula regulatory reform, changing a few laws here and there, making it easier for the foreign investor to enter. And, you know, I think as far as job creation, I agree with, uh, with Richard, and I think we can definitely have quick, successive wins in that aspect. Uh, if I could make just one uh, comment. The area of the world that really demonstrated that jobs could be created in system changes of large scale could happen was East Asia. In 1965, Gunnar Mardil, who was then the, the world's expert on, on Asia, 
predicted that Singapore will, bl uh, uh, will blow up and implode because of its ethnic tensions and because of lack of resources. Of course, Singapore exploded to growth. Uh, but the story of East Asia is figuring out a model that works in staying with it and putting the coalitions of governance that makes the difficult choices. For instance, Singapore's policy from 1965 till now has been around two things, jobs and housing. They've upgraded this continuously over time, but the fundamentals have stayed in place. Uh, so the South Africa, by contrast, could not bring about that kind of internal alliance, particularly in terms of its cities. Uh, so there are lessons, and I think one thing that struck me during uh, the last two days is that the Arab world is being discussed without a comparative context. That a lot of the discussion is internally focused, so it focuses a lot more on problems than on potential range of solutions. It's not that any of those things can be copied simply, but the fora that need to be created for multi-stakeholder coalitions is really one of those urgent things to be put forward because the issue of literacy and what it takes to deliver on policy, again, is critical along the lines that Prime Minister Fayyad has been saying. Because if trust is to be gained, then trust is also about sequence. What can be delivered in what sequence realistically and over what set of things. But this does mean that people need to come and make the hard choices together so then they could stick to it. More uh, questions from, yes, sir. Over. Yes. Yeah. My name is Mario Zabian. I'm from Jordan. First of all, I want, uh, I'm surprised about uh, Mr. Zorbi. He's 27 years old. He said he's hoped to become a minister. To start with... That, that was a joke. Sorry. That was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the most unattractive job in Jordan is being minister. A <laughs> lot of work, a lot of hate. Yeah. This is, well, well, at least you, you, <laughs> you made me, Yanni, because I was shocked. Yani. I saw Mr. <laughs> Fayyad, Yanni, yani, more, 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 more young, younger by, by his thoughts than, than, than your, your Thank approach. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, sir. Uh, about creating jobs and everything, this is not the, the government job, this is not the, the government people, this is not, it's not actually our whole obstacle in our region. All, all the businesses in the world, medium and lower, lower size, which creates the jobs. And in our countries, if Stephen Job was living here, he would have been in jail now, bouncing checks. You know. <laughs> so actually, once you have your it's first chance... Yet, right? <laughs> You know, so having the laws which never forgive you for being an entrepreneur and trying the first time in your life, and then this, this will track you for another 15 years in your life in order to get rid of your first mistake. And of course, your, your, your relatives and everybody will, will always tell you, go get a job, so don't take risk, don't, don't do The don't question, do please. Yeah, my question is very simple. The laws, in, the laws in, in the region, if you want to create jobs, the laws should forgive you for being an entrepreneur, and should forgive you for, for, for trying over and over again, because 95% 95, 95 of any startup business is a failure. So imagine what's happening now in we, all, we in the, all the powers, in yes. all the powers, sorry, my, my, no, I, I want to put a okay. statement. In all the powers and, and our resources in Jordan is human resources. So if I always you know, put them in this dilemma, nobody would want but to be in a job or an NGO employee or somebody in the government or somebody in a foreign company and also waiting for a foreign investment. So we, you know, actually, we can, you know, the, whole, the whole concept and the whole legal and, and, and the non-punishment of the entrepreneurs and everything should be you know, embedded in, in our laws in our, uh, and, also, uh, and, and changing the jobs more than one time in your life. So, a, 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 what you call, a man who, who, who will put gasoline in your car can You're be a road. You're becoming repetitive, so uh, are, are you finished? Or, because you're repeating now your main argument, and we agree with it, but do you, is there a question yeah, directed educa to somebody? Education should be open also for night schools and stuff like that, so people can upgrade themselves, so they will, they will accept any job, knowing themselves later on they will, they will move on. Thank this you. is my concept. Thank you.
Mr. Fayed, would you like to make a comment on the law as the, as the obstacle? Is the government so, or the governments in the region so overburdened by old-fashioned laws that they actually block entrepreneurship? Actually, what I was most impressed by is what Muawiyah said uh, about what laws do or don't do when it comes to how to deal with entrepreneurs or with their spirit. He said we want a government and we want laws uh, that do not, uh, I don't remember Which exactly. Punish. Punish. Punish, punish exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which, the which, tells you, punish. which tells you really the extent the to extent. which, uh, uh, you know, governments have failed, uh, you know, as a matter of fact. Governments have failed on all counts, to be honest with you. General failure. Uh, you know, going back to the most basic when it comes to what a responsible government should be doing. It really, uh, I'm sorry to put it this way, an affront to the intelligence of the common person. Uh, the party line, I mean, uh, and here I disagree a little bit with, with something Mr. Dejani said early on in his intervention about uh, it being fallacious that governments uh, don't control media. I think governments think they control media, but they really don't control media, to be honest with you. I mean, part of the reason why this Arab Spring happened, and it, it was overdue when it did, to be honest with you, it's because there's no one out there who really believed what governments were talking about, to be honest with you. Just total disconnect, absolutely. Governments thought, and they still think to this day, that people, you know, listen to the party line. They could care less, to be honest with you. Laws are very important. There's just no question about that. Rule of law is ultimately what matters. How they are dealt with, are they respected? If you take your case to a court, for example, would you really literally and figuratively have your day in court in a definitive way? Would justice be served? Uh, do you feel you have that remedy or that recourse to justice? I guess these are the finer points. This is a software of governance, if you will, where improvement must take place and take place very quickly. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Monqad Mehar from Friends of the Earth, Middle East. Um, sir, this is a question for the panel, who, whoever would like to answer, but uh, do you think that uh, in the shadow of the Arab Spring also, uh, is it the time coming close that uh, the Arabs in general will realize that uh, they really need to override the borders that have been divided the region in unfair way that some countries are very rich with oil, some countries are uh, uh, poor in a way with natural resources like Jordan or and uh, any to to override these borders that have been set by uh, colonial powers which they were never there and then we'll have a balance that even the young generation can have a a, a chance to touch on uh, uh, resources and also uh, capital thank you anyone on the panel well, I mean, if we're talking about this size speaker agreement, I don't think that you'll find anyone in the Arab world who would be uh, praising the size speaker agreement. I mean, this is a, a black dot in every Arab's uh, history. But, uh, uh, but if you're suggesting a, a, some sort of a European model, which has not been very successful, I mean, in Europe, uh, uh, definitely, I mean, uh, free trade, and uh, it's, it's sometimes, uh, w which I, I've experienced myself and, and many people probably in this room, that you need visas just to travel between one Arab country to the, uh, to the uh, to other. I mean, for just a, somebody who is in business uh, and who, uh, you know, is sent to, to, to three countries, they may need to have three visas issued before they can conduct a simple transaction. I think that's a first step of, uh, of the removal of those uh, requirements would be very helpful in simple form just for trade alone. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Mansoor Khawaja. I just like to just ask a comment from the distinguished panel. Can we say that the trial of uh, uh, ex-president Hosni Mubarak, the outcome will be set the precedent of the misusing of the accountability? 
Mr. Zubi, let's begin with you. What, what would the youth see in the trial of former President Mubarak? By trial, are you talking the actual trial or the whole ordeal of his ousting? Like the physical lawsuits against him? Well, to be honest, um, the whole Egyptian experience after, um, or at least what's going on now, and the continued protests, I, I don't know whether trying Hosni himself um, would have much significance other than just maybe making those who have been directly influenced by him slightly less angry. But let's remember, Hosni was the head of a regime. Okay, he, he wasn't the single person responsible for whatever Egypt has been through. It was a number of people, a class of people, and a system. So um, I'd, I'd say that his trial might have a weak effect at most. Other comments? Or is, is that the... Uh, other uh, questions? Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Batri Wardam. I am a columnist at the Dostur newspaper. I want to ask Mr. Dajani about the accountability of the media in the Arab world, because I think now we are lacking accountability in the media. Most of the media are state-owned, or the others, the so-called independent media, are demand-driven by the masses. So how can we be able to strike a balance between the right to provide information and the responsibility of the media to be, to be held accountable to truth? Mr. Dajani, please. I, I think we are, I mean, I mean making headway, uh, and again, like I said earlier, it's, uh, it differs from country to country, from institution to the other, but uh, you're right. I mean, how can we enforce transparency on institutions and governments when the media itself lacks accountability? And, and this comes with, uh, in, in many forms, from starting with... Uh, uh, new media laws that uh, affect uh, how things are uh, conducted, uh, trainings of, of journalists, and uh, capacity building of institutions. I mean, that's, that's the first thing, so they can uh, instill ethic laws, which is the most important thing. I mean, we do not lack media in the Arab world. I mean, look at Satellite TV, you have more than 700 satellite TV stations just functioning in the Arab world. You don't, it's not that because there is a lack of journalists. It's really the problem that we have, and not that because journalists do not know how to report on a story or do not know how to oper operate producers, do not know how to operate uh, a camera or, or, uh, uh, or uh, direct a show. It's uh, on the ethics issue, and that's the most important thing. It's the, it's the ethics training and the media law. Uh, yes, please. Hello, my name is Imelda Dunlop. I head the Pearl Initiative in the UAE. I have a question for Mr. Fayad. I'd like to know um, what suggestions you have possibly for um, possible incentives to change people's behaviors, whether it's carrot or stick uh, incentives. We've talked about vested interests in economic systems that are based on corruption to some extent. So ideas on incentives to change behavior to get us out of systems which are mired in corruption. Um, Mr. Fed. Can you, can you further elaborate on, on the point of interest here? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. interested in your views on how we can go about changing behaviors. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, for sure, uh, the most important thing is to, in, in governance, when it comes to uh, ensuring that we have um, uh, adequate systems, is to, to ensure that incentives are aligned properly. And that's at least in part what you try to deal with when you try to codify uh, governance processes uh, through laws, uh, regulations, and what have you, uh, for sure. Uh, in economic governance, but also in other spheres of governance. Uh, getting the incentives right is, is, is absolutely important. Uh, if you don't, it would be like cutting against grain. Uh, you have to uh, really apply force of, of some kind to really maintain things the way they are. 
That's what you really should hope for uh, in, in principle, is to get the incentives aligned properly and then to uh, get, for, uh, get conditions right for uh, maximum spontaneity in terms of uh, flow of work processes, uh, flow of governance processes, and actions on the part of private sector participants in the main, but also uh, uh, other important players uh, in the overall political system. Uh, including civil society uh, and various uh, investment groups. Uh, again, uh, having the laws right is important, uh, and laws cannot be right if uh, they don't deal with the incentive alignment right. Uh, but then what is really uh, more important, and I believe uh, particularly in this region, uh, is much more determined effort to apply them, and uh, much more determined effort to ensure they're respected. Uh, and recourse uh, felt by the citizens uh, of their ability and confidence in being able to take the government to court on any given day. I can tell you, although we are not yet a state, a uh, uh, few months into my premiership we have taken to court uh, and lost uh, uh, handily on uh, uh, an issue uh, related to a measure which we thought was very necessary in order to help us reduce our deficit, to be honest with you. Uh, and we had to go uh, to court and fight the case, but it's, uh, well, uh, we won an appeal, but I can tell you for certain, uh, more often than not, the government in Palestine loses in court. Uh, well, you don't want to lose in court when you go to court or when you're taken to court, but to tell you the truth, I felt good about all of these things. Uh, it's very important for people to get a sense of capacity to do this. Uh, take the government to court if, if necessary. Uh, exercise accountability to its fullest. Uh, ask questions, and as Madam Albright uh, was fond of saying, probably is still interrupt. Uh, the last question, please. It's up front. And then I'm going to ask each member of the panels to come back to the question of jobs. One observation on job creation as the central task to conclude with that, please. Uh, hello, I'm Anthony O'Sullivan. I work on MENA in the, uh, f for the OECD. We have a MENA program. And um, on the question of accountability, uh, the new technologies contributed in a chaotic manner to this Arab Spring. And the question is, could new technologies actually, um, internet and all, be harnessed in a much more structured manner to help increase uh, accountability and give a voice to a much wider group of, of population, including women, in, in, in the region, um, so that governments are held more accountable. And maybe using good practices or things that have been used in various uh, scenarios to, to actually do this proactively and not reactively, as, as it seems to be the case right now. Right now there's a kind of scare of, of, of things happening on all f f forms of social media, and it seems like it's just not under, under control, if you want. So is there a way of reversing this and really using different forms of, of, of new technology media to increase accountability and for the panel? Maybe if you could take that question as the most concerned, and then we conclude with one observation on, on jobs as the central task. Of course, of course. Now, now, social media has proven its success, um, um, you know, outside of the regular citizen. Um, in the private sector, companies use it a lot for advertising and marketing and getting their messages across. And it succeeds when they have credibility. When the government does not yet have credibility in the way that it deals with media, whether traditional or online, um, it might be difficult. Previous attempts have been uh, undertaken um, by the government to do social outreach throughout, um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff. And I guess to, 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 the, to the regular citizen, it was not met enthusiastically. So at this point, I think it might be, um, I think the onus is on us as youth, as private citizens, to, to utilize social media to keep doing it until we see some change in credibility, and then maybe perhaps I guess it could be infused within the work of the government just to keep people um, updated because um, it's true, the, 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 demand, the, the continuous demand for questions might be difficult to address in a traditional manner. So it, 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 it has a place to play, but I guess not so soon. Uh, Mr. Boucher, if you could start with you and come back this way. Uh, as OECD, 
given a difficult financial uh, situation internally, how can OECD countries be of best help regarding job creation as, as, a, as the critical task here? I think, uh, you know, we work in this region, as Anthony mentioned, that we've got a, a whole program that we've been doing on governance and investment. And the one place where these two things come together is on the regulatory side. And, uh, you know, I, I join you in destroying the fiction that it's only economics is separate from politics, the regulatory systems, the whole question of how the rules are made determines who wins and who loses. We want to do that as as transparently and objectively as possible, but in a lot of places you have the growth of regulations that protects privilege, that provides an opportunity for graft and corruption because every time there's a rule there's somebody that administers it and there's somebody who asks for money. And so you've got to really simplify the regulatory systems, get down to the very basic framework of how things can operate and let and let things operate on a much fairer basis. And that I think regulatory simplification across the board, including in the job market, because a lot of the problems job for youth that we see in the region, I mean, we see this all over the world, too. Everybody's struggling with jobs for youth. But a lot of the problems are that, that it's hard to take on people for the short term. It's hard to do internship programs, as the gentleman mentioned. It's harder to get somebody who does one job for two years and moves on to something else um, without their getting some you know, very rigid employment rights. And so opening up the regulatory system, I think, would help both create jobs and fight corruption together. Mr. Bejani, uh, the media, is it trained adequately to cover the key economic issues and report on them? And do you have any examples of what's, ha what's happening right regarding job creation? Uh, well, uh, simple answer, no. We still lack a lot of... Uh, expertise in, in covering the economy. And, and I want to say something pertaining to this period. The media is your friend, and it is your enemy at the same time. Uh, we've seen it. Uh, I mean, we need it, of course, to uh, shine the spotlight and, and in the issues of accountability and transparency. But then, at the same time, I mean, if you look at what's happening now, with certain exagger exaggerations or rumors, etc., they've hit many countries very hard. So it's it's very important. I you know I was in Egypt just two weeks ago at uh, what used to be the Grand Hyatt. I forgot the name of it now, but uh, I would be with five or six other people for breakfast in the morning. I mean, people are scared, and this is the most important thing, just to bring people back, to bring investors, to bring tourists. We, the media has also a role to play uh, to, uh, to build the confidence. And, and we've seen it happening, you know, even in the U.S. when with the stock market, et cetera, there is that people, you know, media outlets fighting over that doom and gloom story. And that really kills the economy. And they should be very careful here that they should start reporting on the good stuff, not just only the bad stuff. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister Fayed, leadership. Accountability is central to leadership, but leadership is back about citizenship. What, what do you see as the, as the way of moving forward? I think, as a matter of fact, all of the factors that uh, Ms. Boucher counted uh, in terms of providing the right environment for investment and job creation, all of them. And to those, I would add uh, the importance of having to have a well-functioning social safety net uh, in those societies. You can't turn economic fortunes soon enough to deal, to deal with the needs of those who are unemployed quickly or soon enough. So therefore, you really need to complement uh, the measures that he counted, and I agree with all of them. I agree with him on all of the measures. You need to have a well-functioning social safety net that is not in the nature of standard welfare only, although the provision of that is necessary. Uh, there's no question. That's a very important role for the state to perform. It's very important, because at any given point in time, there are, there's going to be a segment of society. There are going to be those who are, for whatever reason, unable to make it. Uh, government must be equipped uh, to deal with the, the needs of those people. But in addition, uh, I believe at some point I mean, we have to really make peace with ourselves here in terms of priorities. 
Good government is important. Good governance is important. You create more jobs in the immediate future. You lose jobs in the immediate future. You need to decide as society what is important for you at a given point in time. It seems to me there is no good substitute for good governance. Good governance is basic. That's where it really all begins. Uh, now, you may go through a period of upheaval uh, where there is an expectations gap that's very difficult to bridge or deal with. But this is part of growing up. This part of the world is no different than any other region. Uh, you know, our time has come. We need to have good government. Our people deserve good government like any other people anywhere else in the world. Thank you. Mr. Zubi, a quick comment or? Sure. Um, first of all, the fact that a young person is up here with His Excellency, a Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Uh, Dajani, a, a great representative of the media, and Mr. Richard from a world-class international organization, that says something. We're moving somewhere. So I might have sounded slightly negative, but it's only because I'm saying it as it is. However, outlook, I think it's great. I think things will only be better. We're not going to go back anymore. It, this, is, this is a fundamental time in the Arab MENA region history. And hopefully things will be better as, as long as we continue on this path of not only youth, but any stakeholder. Just listen, empower them, and do what's right. Uh, let me conclude with just one word, urgency. We are at a point in time where things can go right, but they can also go terribly wrong. And the test of leadership is going to be to create systems in trust, in building of systems that are going to endure beyond us. And we are also at a very fundamental point of a generational handover. One generation must enter into a compact with another generation and build the bridges so that both could prioritize. And prioritization is going to be tough, but absolutely necessary then to create the field of action and accountability. I'm, first of all, let me thank you, the audience, for being a terrific audience and for your full participation, and then our panel. Please give the panel a hand.